We're lucky that we have individuals that have jumped on to uh, Passive House early on. Um, and I, Kim, I, I should have got you to preempt this, but uh, we should probably pull up Graham's uh, podcast where he dives into his history of, of how he got involved in it. Um, but an early adopter, and now he is the principal of Essential Habitat Architecture, a Northern California-based firm dedicated to modern, high-performance homes that meet Passive House building standards. Graham was one of the first Passive House consultants trained in the U.S., as I indicated, as well as a founding board member of the Passive House Alliance, and Passive House California, his firm has worked on numerous single-family, multifamily, and commercial Passive House projects throughout California and the U.S., including the first certified Passive House in California, the first certified Passive House retrofit in the U.S., and first certified multi-unit Passive House in the U.S., and one more first, the first Fias Plus Source Zero project in California. Graham, how many firsts um, can you do, and what else do you have coming on? So, Graham, let's turn it over to you. We look forward to uh, hearing your presentation. Graham, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Passive House Accelerator, for having me present, and thanks everyone else for tuning in. Um, a little bit of context on this project first. It's, it's a pretty modest project for us. Uh, it was a first home for a young couple, but there are a lot of a lot of the details and findings and so forth can be extrapolated to larger projects. And they were great clients. And it was also a really great opportunity for us to apply all the work we've been doing to make this feasible on a widespread basis and to build as much value into it as we can. So I view the work we do as pragmatic idealism, essential habitat for people, distinctive high-performance modern homes that contribute to a bright, healthy future for the people who live in them and the places we all cherish. Architecture for California. That's the idealistic part. The pragmatic part, basically four pieces to that. Optimizing performance, maximizing value, cost-effective, and constructible details, and the most important part of this to us, quality of life and joy for the people that live in these homes. This is a house uh, before we got involved, uh, constructed in 1955, small house on a small lot on a pretty busy street. Uh, I think pretty typical of millions of post-war houses throughout California and North America. Uh, it was really uncomfortable, too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, uh, dark, cramped. When loud cars would come down the street, it would rattle the whole inside of the house. Uh, but basically a 1,200 square foot house, three bedroom, one and three quarter bath. Uh, when we first spoke with the clients, they they kind of inquired about adding a second story, but that would have required demolishing the entire thing and rebuilding the foundation completely. So it would have more than doubled the cost. So we we settled on a single story design. They also expressed the desire to not have something that made a big bold statement in the neighborhood. And this neighborhood is actually, a, was originally a subdivision of these houses. Uh, we, we also kind of have a soft spot for mid-century modern. And so we kind of like this asymmetrical gable look, and we decided to kind of do an elevated version of this, if you will. So um, expanded it to about 1800 square feet. Uh, and basically, chose to elevate the original design. I know all of you think of California as being this place that celebrates indoor outdoor living. This was the back of the house uh, originally. You literally could not get to the backyard. I think you could walk out the side and around the house to get there, but uh, a great a great before case. And so this is now after. Uh, also want to mention, this house is this this is the back of the house. This is facing west, fronts facing east. So it's actually perfectly in a perfectly wrong orientation for for solar gain. But 
we were able to work with it and improve it and make it happen. And again, we've made a big effort to connect it to the backyard, get a lot of visual connection inside and out, and a lot of porosity with these big lift and slide uh, doors, both on the primary bedroom and the great room of the house. I want to give a shout out to Dave Edwards, who's on the call, uh, the builder, and it's great because during Q&A, he'll be able to uh, hopefully answer specific questions about, uh, you know, get into the weeds on construction details if that's necessary. This company's Earthbound Home. He's also organizing this organization uh, called BABC, Bay Area Building Science Collaborative, which is a group that's meeting to help share knowledge and uh, basically adopt and uh, develop better building practices. And his company did a great job Working with the clients, this, this house did not have budget for an interior designer. He has a really great process. And they were the clients and his staff worked through their process to fill in all those details. And they were awarded a platinum green building award for this project, uh, well deserved, I would say. So talking about optimizing performance. Uh, this is a sunny, mild climate, and I know a lot of you in other climates think, oh, passive house must be really super easy in California. I would say it is more flexible. It's not easy. Summer and winter balance are really important. Uh, these have found these houses are very sensitive to heat gains, which is good and can be bad. So you've got to be very careful not to make something that is comfortable in winter and overheats in the summer or vice versa. It's a, it's a delicate, calls for a deft hand and a delicate balancing act. And then um, this is more of a philosophical thing, but I think it has significant impacts on how one approaches these projects. So passive house has energy use metrics, like how, you know, you can't use more than this much energy to heat, this much energy to cool, this much energy overall. And that can be taken as I should design a building that has low energy use and anticipate that it will be inherently comfortable. My preference is to design something that's inherently comfortable and know that it will result in low energy use. And again, perhaps a subtle shift in perspective, but I think it's fairly critical. And how, we, how do we do this? So I found the uh, passive house energy models to be very powerful, but the inputs are quite cumbersome. And, and so it's very difficult to iterate through design. It's also, there are a whole lot of knobs to turn and it's hard to know which knobs to turn and how much. So I've developed a front end software for the energy model. And again, this is, this is what I'm looking at. This is not for uh, a presentation, um, to people. So it, it looks pretty busy, but that's actually the point. Uh, there are a whole lot of parameters that can be adjusted. And basically, the software plots all of these parameters on a single screen and shows you from the, you know, where you are right now, which things are going to likely to be the most effective to adjust. And I focus not only on heating and cooling separately, but combined demand. So I'm trying to minimize the sum of heating and cooling together and also spend a lot of time focusing on another parameter that's in passive house, which is how much would the house overheat without air conditioning? And that, because I think that's about inherent comfort. A lot of California, our cooling issues are shading issues. And to me, shading issues are design issues. So that's Again, these are deeper topics for another time, but that kind of covers my overall perspective on this. Performance numbers here um, for passive house people, you know, you'll you'll get a sense of those. For others, I think the most interesting things might be the size or how small the heating and cooling equipment required for this home is, and with these high performance homes, our biggest challenge is finding equipment small enough. For, for these buildings, which is a, in, in the big picture, a happy problem to have. In terms of maximizing value, this is looking at the house before, uh, before the remodel, 
you know, they'd, they'd added this kind of flimsy sun porch on at some point in the past. And also at some point, uh, someone had expanded the living space into the garage. So the garage was too small to park cars in and it didn't meet zoning. And again, you can see there, you know, if you want to get to your backyard, I guess you can go out that door. And I think that this was the primary bedroom. I think you could go out that way, but you weren't seeing any of it. Um, and, you know, just typical kind of chopped up, stick the housewife in the kitchen by herself, uh, you know, 1950s architecture. Uh, we've, again, we, we took this on the single, single story, expanded the sides out to the extent we could on the, you know, on the lot lines. And this, we aligned what I call the spine of the house, which is this, you know, the circulation and public space with the ridge of the roof. This is a vaulted ceiling that comes to a peak right here. And so we've got on this side of the house, two bedrooms with a Jack and Jill bathroom. There's also a powder room here for visitors. You come in, lots of storage, home office, kitchen, dining, living room here. And then on this side of the house is a what I call a proper a primary suite. So bedroom with connection, you know, patio doors, walk-in closet, proper primary bath. A couple other things I'll call out. So the attached garage thing is always a challenge, um, less so with electric vehicles, but there are a lot of indoor air quality concerns about having a door from the garage that opens right into the house. And also, eat, you know, it eats up space. Every door needs clear space. So we on the front of this house, there's a, a rain, you know, a flat roof over the entry. And so we move this door to the outside. You can come out of the garage and into the house without being in the rain. And it opened up all of this space for other functions in the house. Another thing we tried to do, even though this is a relatively small house, is make sure there's a lot of storage. It's just because someone's living in a smaller house doesn't mean they have less shoes necessarily. So tried to accommodate all of that. I think we did a pretty solid job with the design and many people have commented on the fact that it feels much larger than it is. We'll dive into some details. Uh, first of all, you really, it's very important in Passive House to think about a continuous layer of insulation all the way around the building and getting rid of all the drafts. So having a continuous air barrier all the way around, but we'll start with the floor and work our way up. This is a crawl space. We typically prefer an insulated slab on grade or a, a walkout basement on hillside lots, but this was an existing crawl space. So we worked with what we had. We do a clean crawl space, basically put a vapor retarder on the ground. And what that allows you to do is reduce the vented openings to a 10th of what they normally need to do, which we do to bring that, that temperature under there as close as we can to ground temperature, which is more moderate than outdoor air most of the time. The air ceiling was the plywood deck. Uh, there's seven and a quarter inches of floor insulation, and we specify that the water pipes be put up in the joist bays. Again, that may be standard practice elsewhere, but there's just no reason to have, especially hot water pipes outside. It's basically a radiator that's cooling off your domestic hot water. The walls, uh, again, well, all of these assemblies on their own are fairly simple. It's the, it's the junctions and connections that are critical. So I didn't put up a picture of a wall here. I put up a picture of all the door and window installations in the, in the walls. And you can also see these dotted lines that indicate where the air barrier, getting continuity for the air barrier. Walls were existing two by four framing. So three and a half inches of cellulose and the, the builder got a hold of a big pile, a truckload or something of surplus polyiso that we used on another project before this and on this one. So um, normally we'll use a stone wool or a wood fiber for our exterior insulation if we're buying new, but this was surplus material. So that seemed like a fine way to go. Uh, the air ceiling is zip sheathing, so the, the sheathing on the outside of the framing beneath the exterior insulation is air sealed. And again, the trick is getting it air sealed 
not only between the sheets, but to the floor and to the roof, et cetera. And the doors and windows are Zola Thermal U, Thermo UPVC. They're about an R7 as, as contrasted with a typical window, which would be like an R3. Uh, Zola has a lot of beautiful higher end windows, you know, wood with aluminum clad, broke, thermally broken aluminum frames and so forth. This is their most affordable line, which is still a really great product. Uh, UPVC is basically a recyclable plastic. And that's basically the walls. Looking at the roof, um, we use what I call a Milburn truss. And I, I call it that after Rick Milburn from Passive Works, who worked with me and Jared Denton from Signum Architects on the first Passive House, certified Passive House in California. Basically, he requests, you basically request a, an additional parallel cord be put in the truss. Here, you know, there's, here's the whole truss. And this has no structural significance, but what it provides is a nailing surface to attach insulation netting. Otherwise, you're, you're going around all this webbing and stuff trying to come up with a, a way to net this. And that allows you to do dense pack cellulose in the roof as opposed to spray foam or, foam or something like that. It's cost effective and also environmentally beneficial. Um, when, we, when we build this, the, the house is sheathed with no overhangs at all. So it's a, it, in general, I'd say passive houses look fairly severe at the, at the framing stage. And then, then basically the, the overhangs are, are added on top of that. And the key is to get a, a, a clean, rigorous air barrier in there. And again, the roof was done with zip sheathing, overhangs added on top, and then some exterior, some more of the poly ISO on top of the sheathing to for condensation control and to meet code for unvented roofs. 12 inches of cellulose, two and a half inches of poly ISO, and then cool roofing. We found that's very important for comfort in California to make sure that we don't get too much solar gain in the summer. A uh, quick thing on the garage roof. So again, this is an attached garage, but we, we actually specified a split truss here. And the reason for that is that you want to be able to get air barrier continuity around the conditioned space. So again, the garage was basically added on to the building after the fact in the construction sequence. Details around shading. So this is the back of the house, again, facing west. Uh, we optimized, found that 36 inch eaves all the way around was the best, low gain glazing and this pergola. And I consider this part of the space conditioning system. So rolling this thing out in the warmer months to provide shade underneath and keep the shade off. And then you can roll it back in the winter and get sun into your house when it feels good. Uh, but it's also a very lovely place to sit. And I, you know, you can note, look at those tomatoes, like really uh, taking advantage of that backyard. And I mentioned this to them. I don't know if that came from me or not, but, uh, you know, to get privacy, they've got these fruit trees. Oh, sorry. Fruit trees coming up. And I'm, I'm particularly pleased by that because Sunnyvale, before it was all plowed under, was was fruit, you know, was was uh, orchards. So it's sort of bringing back a little of that, that previous uh, zeitgeist to the area. I'm gonna try to speed up a little bit, but uh, induction, induction, this is an all electric house. So in an induction and convection range, refrigerator, dishwasher, condensing dryer. So it has no venting to the outside. Again, that's electric. And in the living room, they have a bioethanol fireplace. So when they want to fire, they can burn uh, alcohol uh, much safer than any other kind of uh, combustion. In terms of water use and efficiency, it's got a heat pump water heater. Another thing we've learned in California, we don't want to have that tank inside the house. It basically adds a cool creates a, a, a cooling load. This, this uh, enclosure that it's in is really well insulated, better insulated than a regular house. And the tank is well insulated. 
but it is kept out of the envelope because insulation just slows heat flow. It doesn't stop it. And having a 120 degree tank of water inside the house in the summer causes a lot of discomfort or it certainly hurts summer comfort. Drain water heat recovery is something we also do a lot. We did not do it in this house because it's one story, but I understand there are some newer products coming out that actually work in the floor of the shower. So we're, we're keeping an eye out for that. The typical units require a full height, full story drop. Uh, we also do structured plumbing for domestic hot water delivery to save on whatever lukewarm water is in the pipes before you get there. And you also get uh, instant hot water to your shower which is a nice thing, just living wise. Plum for rainwater readiness, basically providing dedicated supply to the toilets and the laundry that initially are connected to city water, but they're, they're accessible outside so they can be converted over to use rainwater should someone want to put that kind of a system in. Uh, low water permeable landscape, which is key. Again, efficiency on that uh, is more important than how you supply it. And then we also plumb for gray water readiness. Again, that has to do with how you direct the drains and put them in a way that you don't have to, if you want to put gray water in up right away, you can, but if you want to do it later, you don't have to tear the whole house apart to, to put that system in. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, air, okay. So air, air quality, this house is ventilated with a Zender heat recovery ventilator. And for those of you that don't know what that is, it's simplified. It's like two fans and a radiator basically. And this is plumbed throughout the whole house with small ducts. So the bathrooms, the laundry and the kitchen are being ventilated continuously all the time. But instead of having bath fans that just blow that air out of the house, all that air goes through the central unit and is sent outside and the radiator or the heat exchanger in the unit in the winter time uses the warmth of the air that's leaving to warm fresh air that's coming in from outside that might be cold. In the summer, if the air inside is cooler than what's outside, the air that's leaving cools the air coming in, coming in. So it basically recycles the heat while changing the air over continuously. The air is filtered and delivered to the bedrooms, the living spaces, and, and all of that stuff. And this, contrary to what some people may believe, leads to a higher air quality than typical houses where air is just leaking in from all over the place without being filtered at all. We have a vented range hood with dampers, so it's not a recirculator, it basically is extracting, but when it's not in use, the intake and the supply are closed off. We were also experimenting with adding, so another thing about having your ventilation air supplied from a predictable single source is that you can filter it, and it is filtered within the system but we've also been doing experiments about adding a supplemental HEPA filter during wildfire events, which are unfortunately becoming more and more common. Incredibly effective for, for keeping that smoke out of a house. And again, a leaky house, it just leaks in constantly. There's really no way to control that. Just to give you a sense of what these folks are not breathing, these are the filters that are built into the heat recovery ventilator. This is, these are the exhaust and this is the supply, but these are seven months old and that's a clean one and that's a dirty one. So you can get a sense of the dirt that didn't come into their house uh, through that time and extrapolate what that means in terms of health. In terms of energy use, uh, this is a graph starting from when they moved in to this last month. The homeowner wanted to wait before he installed his solar, his PV, to figure out you know, what size a system it should be. And then there was some rigmarole getting it permitted and so forth. And the short and the long of it is the solar got installed in October of last year, but really only interconnected to the grid in January of this year. Some other observations. 
Before the house was remodeled, the utilities were about $150 a month, but this house went between 55 and 95, and there were no cars being charged. After the remodel, before the solar was installed, the utility, you know, and there's also been inflation in this too, but that's probably a minor factor, $180 a month, perfectly comfortable house, and charging two electric cars. So it was $180 a month for all the energy they basically needed to buy for their lives. Once the solar was installed, their bills went down to an average of about $9 a month of electricity. There's also an $11 connection fee. So it was about $20 a month in utilities, again, running their whole house and charging their two cars. With solar, their April bill was negative $67. So they paid, they basically paid off the first three months of the year in April. And you can sort of sort of see where this graph is going. This is going to get further and further negative. They're, they're you know, they're they're um, already negative for the year and and sort of tracing it backward. I think they will stay that way till about October, at which, which point they'll be drawing from the grid again. But it's a very, very small draw uh, and very low cost. By comparison, typical, typical California home would be using about 33 household, I should say, about 3,300 kilowatt hours per month with one car. And so they're using about 1,000. It's pretty flat. You know, there's no real seasonal effect here. They're using about 1,000 kilowatt hours before they even put their solar on with the solar and they have batteries installed, their highest draw, so December where they have the least amount of solar output is about 688 kilowatt hours. So that's what about 20% of what a typical California house would be using. Their solar system is not a gigantic solar system. So you can see, the roof, this is the south facing roof, about eight and a half kilowatts of PV and two Tesla power walls. So it's not some crazy giant thing with a massive solar system. It's a relatively typical average, maybe smaller than average solar system with some battery storage that makes this happen. And that's because this home is so efficient and the house itself actually functions as a thermal storage system. It's it's basically a thermal battery, the house itself is. It maintains its temperature fairly easily, um, not needing, so you, you basically don't need to store energy in your battery to run your space conditioning later. The house itself does that storage for you. Lastly, and most importantly, quality of life and joy. So this is this was actually a test shot from the when the architectural photographer came in and I, you know, I said, God, I love that picture. Can I use it? And she said, well, it's a test shot, but sure, I'll let you, you know, so I want to make it clear this is not her polished uh, final shot, but I love this because it's got the homeowners over here and these, they're talking to the folks who were helping stage and obviously you've got COVID masks on. So it's a time capsule shot, but they just seem very comfortable and happy in their home. And again, you're looking, looking from the front door toward the back at the peak of the roof. This is, you know, the, the center of the house. There's no extra lighting on for this shot. This is all daylit. And what pleases me the most, so this is a quote from the homeowner saying, the design really encapsulates everything we were hoping to enjoy. And the passive house benefits have really been as great as you said they would be. And any, any of you that know me, if someone's saying that the passive house benefits have really been as great as you said they would be, they're probably really great because I'm a big fan of this thing. So I, I really want to thank John and Adrian for the opportunity to help them create this home. And I am thrilled that they're so happy to be there. And I think it's just a really great little house that's doing amazing things in terms of pointing the way toward a livable future for all of us. And that's really the end of this. Um, we're gonna go over to questions soon. 
I, I call this architecture for the future of California kind of has a double meaning. Uh, but I wanted to say to people who are maybe uneasy or unsure about this approach, a couple things. One, I'm pretty convinced this is the way we're all going to end up building eventually. But more importantly, there's no downside to this. This is all the energy benefits aside, this is a more comfortable, quiet, livable, healthier kind of home to be in. Thank you very much. Well, Graham, bravo. Excellent presentation. Um, of course, great delivery again. True leader and uh, an educator. We're lucky to have you. And, and again, great story. Now we're going to get into questions in a second. So you can have a moment to pause and uh, have a sip of whatever beverage you have, because we're going to head over to sponsors. So Hi, I'd like to give a big thank you to the fine organizations that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. First, a big shout out to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you, too, to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel, Minotaur, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And thank you to our champion sponsors, Bewiso, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, Prosico, and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Brennan Brennan, Coltraco Ultrasonics, Euroline Windows, Holstrom System, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and US Engineered Wood T-Stud. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you, sponsors. All right, Graham, you can see that the uh, question queue is lined up for you. So uh, uh, we'll try to get through it as fast as we can. Can uh, I do, uh, Sean, sorry to interject. Can I share my screen quickly one more time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll do this properly. I noticed some people are asking for more information. Anyone interested in a guide? So we have this guide that we're assembling. And if you would like this, just go to website essentialhabitat.com. There's a contact us button. Just go there, hit the contact, say send send us this guide that we're in all, you know, in full disclosure, still polishing off. It's almost finished, but it's basically a guide through these principles and how to get started and succeed with your projects. Awesome. So yeah, so uh, Kim has put that link in uh, in the chat so people can gather on. Um, so great stuff, Graham. And um, again, appreciate the fact that uh, not only do we have this presentation that'll be on uh, the Passive Accelerator's website as well as YouTube page in a few days, so people can even refer to this as to kind of get going. Because again, I really like how you break down. Um, again, it's all about language, and I like how you instead of breaking down like the Passive principles, you really focused on the water aspect the uh, um, the energy and just being able to just, you know, use language differently in the process of breaking down. And um, again, excellent stuff, but let's turn it over to questions. Uh, Shanda, you are first, if you want to uh, unmute and ask your question. Otherwise, I'll uh, ask for you if you don't pop on. Um, now, again, this is, so this, this is kind of a generic question, but, uh, um, it's, she, uh, the person asked, does pH make sense for South Florida? And I know uh, Zach put a great link for FIAS's conference, the FIASCon, which will happen in Houston. So there'll be a lot more conversations about bringing Passive House to warmer southern climates of the U.S. But what would you say to that comment? What would I say? Uh, yes. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> I have not worked in South Florida but I have done studies within California. I'm getting a poll here and I'll just. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I've done studies across California with Passive House. We don't have that kind of humidity, but we do have Palm Springs. You know, we have very hot climates. Um, some of the benefits are not there when you don't need the heat that's being generated inside the house, but an efficient envelope keeps heat from moving from inside to out or outside to in. So it's about cont having control over that interior environment. You know, again, I'm not pretending that, a, that to, to design something for South Florida right now, but it, it, all of that efficiency will definitely have a big benefit. 
And then you also are getting blocking sound out and having better indoor air quality as well. So yes. Great. All right, moving on to uh, Robert, Robert Tanner. Yes, ben, hey, Robert. great presentation. Uh, so with a client that has budget focus, other than architectural design, how would you prioritize the passive house uh, factors if not all can be accomplished in the design? Is it all or nothing, or would you prioritize? That's a great question, and maybe there's a, well, I'll, I'll try to answer it as simply as I can. Um, the, I mean, every building to some degree has some of these elements in it, right? So to me, Passive House is taking these good practices and applying them to an optimal place. So when people, you know, people sometimes, and not everybody, but sometimes people come and they sort of say, well, I, I understand this is Passive House. I want to save money. So I want to back off to here. Our optimization process is an optimization process. So again, the, the project that I did, this one well exceeded the standards for Passive House, but it was done in a cost benefit analysis. So it, it's very dependent on what, which, you know, what project you're working on, but I'm pained to think of like, it's basically like, what benefit would you like to give up? And so that, that might, I mean, I, you know, had, if I had to make a choice, I'd pick comfort and health before energy efficiency, to be quite honest, but it's all about optimization. So it's, it's really generally a good thing to invest in. And I get, and I'll say, you know, this project was maybe, and we find this typically maybe 10 to 15% more than building just a typical home. And if you want to extend it toward cost of operation, how small the solar system had to be and how small the batteries have to be to operate at this level, I think, I think it's a false economy to do things like strip away insulation, but it's, it's very project dependent. But again, I would say that it's not, this is not like some crazy mindless exercise of spending money out of guilt it's optimization it really is like building designing and building the the optimal shell to my and mind did you did you uh, uh get the fias or phi uh certification on the house we did not that was not in the budget for this i i think it's a great thing to do but we did not so I guess that, that I th and I think Skyler had a mention in his presentation about it, saying like if if some if your client's telling you they can't afford a proper ventilation system, don't sir, don't spend money certifying it. Spend it on the ventilation system. And again, I I think the certification is terrific, super important, great quality control. But I would I would take I would take that off before I made the building less robust. Thank you. Great presentation. Sure. Yeah, great well, question. Thank you for your question. So, Graham, let's just dive into that because I know there's a couple more people, you know, wondering about cost. And, and I was wondering too is, is I mean, I know that the electric cars aren't playing the construction budget, but did they have like a budget of what they were moving their lives to? And so they had more of a generic of like, hey, we're going to build this house. We're going to buy two solar cars. We're going to do the solar panels. Like, did they have a bit of a plan of how they were going to get to this? you know, I'd say more efficient lifestyle and a cleaner lifestyle? That's a great question. And I'm going to com confess with a bit of embarrassment that I did not understand all of the intentions. And I've only learned recently through getting data from John that he's been geeking out hard on this. Like, so he, I think he did have some kind of plan up front. He, I, he's very involved with energy monitoring. I mean, there's a piles of data that I still need to sort through. So I think that was part of his idea. And I think he he also mentioned that back before they remodeled the house, he didn't use the furnace that much. You know, they were they were pretty uncomfortable. Uh, so that something about that was important. And I will also add about that sort of experiment of 
turning the heat off and letting it get cold and stuff. He gave up on that. He was like, it's pointless. We might as well just be comfortable because we don't need much energy to do this anymore. There's nothing, there's nothing substantial to be gained by letting this thing be anything less than perfectly comfortable because the, the yeah. conditioning energy, it's just, it's the, this is not a hair shirt kind of solution, right? This is living better uh, in a sustainable way. So just to confirm kind of the retrofit was the walls stayed, the roof got switched over with that a really, really amazing roof detail. And then you redid the floor. I'm I'm going to say no to both of those, but I'm also going to invite Dave Edwards, who who actually did this project. And he's here if he'd be willing to to give you the narrative on that. So this is the builder. Dave, if you want to pop on, I we got a couple minutes before we got to go to the uh um, future events, but Dave, if you want to just kind of clarify, that would be, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. So, uh, we did not keep the walls. So we did a previous passive house project with Graham where we tried to keep the walls as part of a budget, uh, con consideration, uh, but using the floor diaphragm, uh, with the walls intact turned out to be a giant nightmare. So on this project, uh, because most of the walls were changing anyway, we pulled all the walls down, um, decked the entire floor with brand new plywood that was all taped and seamed at the seams and then glued down uh, and then built the new walls on top of it. Uh, it was much more cost effective uh, to get that process than to try to go back and fix all of the holes that we couldn't find underneath the plates of the house. Okay, great input. And again, great work, David, and uh, appreciate you hopping on and being uh, um, the call of friend uh, aspect to tonight's uh, today's presentation. So great stuff. All right, Kim, if you're ready, one of some of our group might be departing to carry on with their day. Uh, again, want to thank you for a great presentation and for all of you that showed up today. Again, thank you. Now, please carry on learning, sharing, collaborating with the community, because again, we got to keep this thing going. And uh, you know, there's lots of resources out there from all the amazing uh, events that we've posted on the Passable Successor YouTube page, as well as with this brand new, amazing YouTube page called Reimagine Buildings that Kim just talked about. Check it out. Um, really insightful projects. And you might see some familiar faces because, uh, you know, Mr. Ingui has to show up and uh, some other uh, amazing individuals that are showcasing their projects. So that being said, um, Kim put it in the chat, but if you have a project that you're super proud out of and you wanna share it, you know the Accelerator wants to be there to help uh, showcase that particular project, um, or if it's an idea, an invention, again, there's construction tech that we can bring you on. So reach out to Kim and uh, again, get on our schedule. We'll be uh, happy to showcase your project. So um, that being said, uh, good day, good afternoon. We'll see you later. If you want to still continue on, we've got a long list of questions. And I believe Greg West was next in the queue. So Greg, you come on if you're still with us. Otherwise, we will skip you. Greg, one, two, three. Hello, I'm here. Oh, it's just snuck in there. <laughs> Go ahead. So I was just curious about the type of roofing that was used, but someone did answer my question about it being like just a light colored, uh, typical asphalt shingle. That's right. There, you know, and there are, the, the color is one thing. There's also some reflective elements that can be added to these, these shingles as well. So you can have one that's almost the same color as another, but there's some extra reflective elements that can be added. So we're basically looking for a, a low absorptivity roofing. And while we're on the roofing, I know uh, Ben had a question. So Ben, I'll cut you off and and uh, and just ask you just because we're on it. Um, just concerns of like future proofing of the roof, at the low pitch and worrying about moss and, and kind of those kind of conditions with that particular roofing choice. Is there any concerns? Maybe, uh, David, I mean, David, you want to? Chime in. Yeah, so we have ice and water shield un uh, underneath the shingles, uh, which gave us our kind of bomb proof uh, waterproofing. And this is California. Uh, we don't get a whole lot of moss here, uh, except in the mountains. And this house is definitely not in the mountains. So we don't have to worry about that. All right. Well, Ben's from BC, so we get moss up here. So that's why he's has that of a concern. So all right, uh, moving along, uh, Peter, I know you had a couple questions. Maybe we just start with one of your most ready to go question. Um, Peter, you still with us? 
I think I saw you. Oh, Peter might have hopped off. Um, Tom Phillips, I know you got a couple questions, Tom. Yeah. How you go? Yeah, howdy. Thanks. Um, uh, I guess the first one is uh, using future climate data and designing because the cooling loads aren't huge down there in the Bay Area, but they're going to grow by maybe 50% by mid century and so on. Um, so I'm just wondering if you factor that in for life cycle comfort and a shift to a more cooling dominated climate. And then the related question was about uh, a reflective shading on your pergola uh, because the typical kind of awnings, in fact, we got one, turns out they're real hot underneath from the radiant temperature out several feet. So uh, I'm kind of wishing I'd gotten a reflective one instead. And then that west facing low sun uh, on that deck, uh, how'd you handle that? So I'll try to keep all keep all this in my queue and answer in order. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Deshaun, did you want to say something? No, no, no. I was just you oh. had three questions you had to answer. So get going. Um, yeah, yeah. So one, uh, I did not do any future forecasting on how global warming would affect that building performance. I will say I'm not overwhelmingly concerned about that in this case because the the heating cooling system is oversized well for both just because of how how small the, the demand and loads are but it's oversized more so for cooling than heating so i think it's got that handled um it's also the heating i mean i'm sorry the cooling occurs during periods when there's a lot of solar energy involved. So again, I'm not trying to trivialize that, but I think the bigger problem for us moving forward is providing energy when heating is involved. So I don't know if that's punting your question, but uh, that's kind of where I am with that. I'm certainly receptive to further considerations of that. The second one was about the reflective, oh yeah, reflective awning. That's a great, great, issue uh, to consider. I don't know where they are with that. My initial thought was, if that's a problem, it's pretty easy to fix, right? Because it's just something, I mean, and I'm not trivializing, trivializing what you're saying, but the building shell itself is solid. So if the awning, if it's too hot under that awning because the, uh, the fabric is not reflective, they can easily switch that out. I've also had other projects where people do this with deciduous vines, but um, all of those things. And then you asked about the low sun. It is west facing. There's only so much you can do, but we, again, in the energy model, optimized to cut that down. We, you know, the, the big picture solution would be to have exterior blinds that drop down, but I didn't feel like that was feasible nor necessary. And they've also got those fruit trees that are coming up, right? So. It, they're going to get it. It's going to be, it's well handled, I think, and it's going to be well controlled. But again, we, we were stuck with the orientation we had, and I would rather have that connection to the backyard than have what we had before, which was basically a blank wall. Yeah, we've got a similar problem with our mid-50s house in Davis, and uh, especially when the big shade tree went down. And uh, and I found out later in Europe, they do have that reflective um, shade type material. I don't know if it's available here yet. Good questions, thank you. Yeah, great question, Tom. And again, we need to see that kind of sweet spot when the shade comes through over the, uh, you know, the, the roof shading that comes out and then between the trees and like that gap between there, how much sun comes through and how much it affects things. But great questions. And again, love, love the level of detail. Um, sorry, Lisa, I didn't mean to skip you. Uh, again, too many uh, dials I'm turning and uh, no disrespect. Lisa Ruckman, are you still with us? And That's please that. ask your question. Yes, I am. Um, I, thank you for the for mentioning the um, the deciduous vines um, and the, the shade trees. I, I'm just wondering, like, when you're very focused on the building, how much attention is paid to the plants as far as not just trees, but other shrubs and things that can provide um, shade that helps a lot with eating? How much attention is, well, you're talking in, in how I energy model or how I design? 
we do. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, fair enough. Um, we do account for landscape shading in the ener in this energy model. It's a very rigorous energy model. Um, I did not model for, I took basically existing conditions. So I did not model like, hey, once these trees get this high, it'll be great. So I, I, and I think that's being conservative in this case. In terms of how I design, having the house connected to the landscape and that whole thing. I'm, you know, I'm not a landscape architect and there wasn't a landscape architect on this, but it, it was, it, it was always on my mind. Who sang that? Is that Willie Nelson? Yeah. Um, and, and I did again, talk to them like, yeah, it'd be great if you had, you know, it's a small backyard. Let's bring back some of that orchard. So I'm, I'm all for it. And uh, maybe the last comment on that, on the deciduous vines, I'm a big fan of kiwi myself, personally. Um, grapes can kind of make a mess of your deck, but the kiwi vines, you know, right, you like kiwi. Big leaves that come off every winter. Great questions, Lisa. And I mean, I think this is interesting too, Graham, is, is we don't have sometimes the right budget to bring all the consultants we need in. And so if the team can add their own flavor and experience to just add tidbits of saying, hey, this isn't my specialty, but I've seen this on other projects and maybe you should consider it and let the clients um, think about some of those really important factors. Um, at least it's on the table for discussion. And I mean, I really love how you have mechanical plans in there um, and the fact that you've got the PHP data or sorry, the Woofy data to kind of back it up. It just helps clarify. I know, I know as in here, we've got the step code, we're moving forward and we designers and architects stop at the plan set. I'm like, okay, well, we need to bring in the mechanical team and have these discussions beforehand. And the fact you've already kind of thought about it, I think is really interesting to kind of give a, the context of how you run the joist and how you're trying to think of how things um, will, will be developed and put through when it comes to the specialists, um, aka subtrades, um, you know, through the process. So it's really interesting that you're added that extra level of detail to start conversations before you start building um, you're, really simple stuff. You're raising a really great point that's been a focus of mine lately. And I want to say again, that Dave and his team did a really great job working with the clients to fill in a lot of the, uh, particularly interior design details. You know, he's got a whole system and a whole process that does that. He, you know, he got involved late, as far as I'm concerned, is particularly with my current perspective, late in the process through no fault of his own, but it was basically already designed and permitted near, or, or if not permitted, ready to permit. And I've yeah. really shifted my thinking around this and now am basically committed to having a builder on board from conceptual design onward. And it doesn't and doesn't it doesn't commit the client at that moment you know i don't want to tell people like you pick this builder and you're going to work with them no matter what they charge you builder is compensated to help develop the budget and then at the end if the client chooses to put it out to bid they can I, most people will see that there's no wisdom in that yeah. but bringing bringing a builder on very early in this is really important just i think the budget is the design and the design is the budget. And also as everyone, everyone who's designed a passive house knows there's so many details in there and just throwing that out there and expecting people to be able to understand everything that's involved with, you know, it, with very limited time to review it. It's just not a functional approach. So my apologies, Dave, for not having you involved earlier, but that this is how for exactly what you're saying. So very astute comment, Sean. Thank you. Well, Graham, and I'm glad you bring it up because I know builders now, and Dave, I'll get you to ask this or answer this in a second, is, is just that, you know, builders now need to have two kind of modes of contracts when they meet with clients is one being, hey, we want to be part of the design phase. So we'll give you a pay per hour fee. And then we'll deal with either the fixed or cost plus contract once we get to building. But we need to have this integrated design processes early on and architect, designer, builder, client, and other consultants, depending on what the scope of work is, need to be involved early on because I know we talk about, you know, the five passwords principles. They're also the five P's of proper planning prevents poor performance. So it's all 
key in this whole thing. So David, maybe do you want to just explain um, how, because you were gone early, did you end up having two contracts with the client or do you, do you just kind of modify a design fee in your, in your contract to, uh, to kind of review these things earlier on? So uh, we've learned over many years of doing it wrong that the best way to do it right is to um, court, just do exactly what Graham says, come in right at the end of design development or even at the beginning of design to give the client, the architect feedback on where the budget's going. Uh, and then we have developed uh, over many years and it continues to evolve a really strong pre-construction process. And our pre-construction process is we're paid for that. And that work is basically to try to, to get the job to get built, which is such a problem, right? Like so often you have designs that run a skew of the budget uh, and early on. And if you can kind of short circuit that at the beginning, your project has a lot better chance of getting built. And so what we're doing is guiding the architect and the design team, as well as clients to really think about budget in the context of this whole project. And when you think about budget early, you stop having to make bad decisions later on, right? Oh, we're going to cut off this, or we're not going to put in the right ventilation system, or, you know, for budget, we're going to get rid of the exhalation or whatever, right? So what we're finding is that we actually, when we start early, uh, and we also do what Graham says, which we, we have a separate pre-construction contract. That contract is just for pre-construction. At the end of that, our deliverables are greater than 90% of decisions for the entire project are made. Uh, the clients understand budget. They understand who's doing it. It's a completely transparent process. We're sharing all the data with them. And they're not having to make these really tough decisions later on because we're constantly feeding them information, getting them to buy into that whole process. And what we've seen is that we've never had a client out in pre-construction go to work with another builder because we're showing them everything and it's totally transparent. Uh, and we almost never have projects not get built because we're giving them this information because it's in everybody's best interest and we're all rowing together. Uh, you know, you get these projects built and then you don't have to kill them performance or energy efficiency or indoor air quality by choosing poor materials because you've already planned that way ahead of time. Yeah, that's excellent. Great stuff. Thanks for sharing that, David. And I'm sure too, is all that proper planning. Again, you're sticking to your schedules. There's less change order because all of those discussions are really hammered out in the, you know, non-building phase when technically I'm sure you and your team and with Graham built it three or four times in your head, in conversations, um, in mock-ups and, uh, and then carried it out. So um, great stuff. Okay. We got a couple more minutes. We still have more questions. Uh, Leal, if you're still with us. You are next. Leo, I know I, I see you're there. So that you come on in three, two, one. I don't want to skip you because I can see you're still there. Question was, oh, easy one. How much solar was on there? How much? 8.5 kilowatts. Gotcha. TV. And uh, it's, I mean, it, and just a side note too, is what I like about what you did there, Graham, was, is, you know, you looked at the operating carbon and then you guys were quite aware of the embodied carbon, but the fact that you're able to get free material from other projects, great analysis in, in that process, electrified the building and then put a much solar on. And again, now we're looking at the, the solar panels are, are one or like number two or three in the embodied carbon standpoint. So maximizing everything else is pretty interesting. Now, did, I know you guys put the Tesla power walls on. Um, um, is the community, I know Skylar and Zach talk about this, is the grid nearby pretty dirty or is the local, like just maybe just comment quickly of the, how dirty is the local grid? The local grid's pretty clean, relatively speaking, yeah. but dirtier, you know, I mean, and again, that's an hourly by hourly thing, gotcha. right? Um, cleanest in this you know in the middle of at noon on a sunny day gotcha no right? very cool and then yeah. now they've got electric cars um do they factor in maybe electric cars being batteries as well and being part of that resilient package so that that's a great i mean i think we're at the cutting edge of this stuff and i would say yeah you know you, you, people are working on this 
you can use your car batteries as your house batteries, right? Once the technology evolves and they don't, and, and John knows much more about this than I, like the interface between the grid and his batteries and so forth is not optimized yet. I think the te Tesla is working on something to do more of that. Um, I'd also say, I think his solar system's bigger than he needs. Gotcha. And if he's already zero, if he's zero January through March with April, right? He basically needs September to do October, November, December. And then there's four months of extra. So, I mean, not to knock him, but I think the, I think the, the impact of having batteries on there and the, the larger harvest that he's able to apply to his own home with those batteries means that a typical net PV sizing calculation is bigger than he would have needed for that. Yeah, so absolutely. it'll be interesting to see, but it, it's a game, you know, it's a game changer. And this building, these buildings are the perfect platform for renewable energy. Yeah. Um, that's my big takeaway for everybody. That's, that's key. Well, it's really insightful. And I know Leo just had another question too. Um, uh, the solar panels, the, the, some of them were moved around to deal with roof fence. And was there any thought process of putting those roof fence on the north side of the roof versus the south side? Or was it just like, that's as good as it could get? That's the, that was the kitchen. That's the kitchen hood vent, I believe. But I'll let Dave speak to that. Yeah, we try to uh, isolate our uh, vents as much as we can when we're able to. Um, we couldn't transfer that vent over any much farther than uh, it was moved, uh, but everything else is isolated to reduce penetrations. Great. The other thing I did by showing that satellite photo, I didn't mention it, but that roof is not covered with solar panels. Yeah. Right. There was a lot of extra room. And, and again, it zeroed. They zeroed them. So if you're just talking about finances now, and I know there's a whole deep conversation, but if you're just talking about utility bills, April zeroed their year year so okay great stuff graham um i think because of time i'm sorry everyone we'll have to cut it off uh i know there's still more questions but we're uh, we've kind of hit that point where we just ran out of time so uh um you can email graham and or connect with david or email us we can figure out how to get those questions answered um and again uh, download or get connected with graham on that design step-by-step -step guide that is in process, more insight for information. Um, and always, you know, gentlemen, always good to have you on. David, thanks for uh, being the call, call a friend for today. Very insightful, great stuff with what you guys are up to. And uh, happy to showcase more of your individual projects because you guys are definitely doing it the right way. And like you said, you could do a bit better, but you know, only every project you hit certain goals and you just keep making uh, substantial improvements. So excellent efforts, what you guys are up to. Um, Tim, I think we've captured everything. Um, always very insightful stuff. And, uh, I think Zach jumped off, but again, hopefully he has a fabulous birthday and Kim, I'll let you hit the exit button and we'll depart. And I'll just say thank you to everyone for their time. I know everyone's busy. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, we appreciate your time. I mean, this is just the details that you provided is just fantastic. And hopefully you see all the great comments and all the kudos that uh, is filling up the chat with. So Graham, um, excellent work. And just, again, the language you use, and I know you've done this a, lot, a few times. It's not your first first rodeo here, but um, the the language you use is, is, is really the trigger point of how we're going to move this, is how to clarify things to the clients and make sure that they understand you know, it's kind of like I, I kind of say we're kind of into that point, maybe a bit of fast Paso's fight club where we don't talk about it. We just do it and language we use to infiltrate our clients so that they get these comfortable, healthy buildings, even though we have a uh, tactics and, and methodologies and data to, to back up our approach. So great stuff.